Hi students, uh, this is the lecture on chapter four, which is on Newton's laws and forces. Okay, so this is a, uh, I like to actually say that, you know, without sounding uh, over the top, that I would say this is probably the most important chapter in all of science. And why I, and I'll explain why I say that. Um, and it's really gets to the point where Isaac Newton, and, in, and you see in this chapter, Isaac Newton brought forth for the very first time to humanity the laws of physics, the laws of the universe. Never before. Uh, did anybody know about laws of physics? And so you will see in this chapter, you know, in our, in our development of the theory of mechanics, that we will see for the first time that we can actually build a theory based upon fundamental laws. And so why is this so important? Well, because other scientists will look at this and ask the question, might there be laws of physics, fundamental laws for other phenomena. Might there be laws of physics for, let's say, heat and thermal behavior? Yes, we have the four laws of thermodynamics that have, it still have to be discovered. Might there be laws for electric, electricity and magnetism? Now, I, I say electricity and magnetism as separate sciences uh, because that's how they were viewed at the time. Uh, we know when we study physics too that actually they are a manifestation of one overall theory called electromagnetic theory. That they are one of they are actually two sides of the same coin, but back in Newton's time they did not know that, and so people would be and of course you know there are laws in you know there's in you know development of chemistry and other sciences really all based upon understanding that there are fundamental behaviors of the universe and you need to find them. These behaviors are do not have a more primary cause. So, so Isaac Newton. He lived between uh, 1642 and 1727. All right, so he really brought brought the concept of laws of physics. And as I will describe, he really gave us, I mean, among other things, the three laws of motion, okay, and the uh, law of universal gravitation. And these laws, particularly the law of universal gravitation, had a wow effect that we really do understand, for instance, how planets move. We can predict it. We can, we can use this law of gravitation to predict the motion of the Earth around the sun, the motion of Venus around the sun, Mars, Jupiter, you name it, the, the motion of Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto around Jupiter, the motion of our moon around the Earth, any kind of motion of a celestial body under the influence of gravitation can be described by this law of gravitation precisely. And this gave us a feeling of great power and understanding that, yes, there truly is this law of the universe. And it is absolutely there. And we do not know why it's there, but it is indeed there. And so might there be other laws. So, you know, you'll notice that the one of the fundamental laws of electricity we call Coulomb's law, which we'll study in chapter, in, in, uh, well, in physics two, um, Coulomb's law looks very much like, like Newton's law of universal gravitation. They almost look like twin laws, if you will. Uh, universal gravitation laws, I kind of said, and when we talked about in, in chapter one about the study of uh, fundamental forces, these are fundamental force laws are laws that are based upon, that, that exist because a particular body has a certain quality. You know, a law of universal gravitation is true because a body has what's called mass. Two bodies have mass, they have an attraction, a gravitational attraction. In Coulomb's law, two bodies have electric charge or unbalanced charge. 
then they have what is called, uh, and they have electrical attraction or repulsion. And we'll talk about that. You can actually have attraction or repulsion in electricity. All right. So um, now I, I will talk more about the history of physics and science earlier on in the class. And then uh, I'll, I'll be a little bit less historical as we go along, or actually quite a, a lot less historical. You know, we're, we're still building up things. And so, and I think that is worth discussing Isaac Newton because he is such an incredibly important figure in science. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Isaac Newton, and then we'll get into what Isaac Newton did, and we'll continue our development of mechanics. So again, I think it's very important for people to realize that I think if you were to ask you know, a hundred people at random who are the most influential people who ever lived, I would say that very few people would actually would actually say Isaac Newton is their answer. And quite frankly, pretty much everybody should say that. And I'm not just saying that's because I have a bias as a physicist. Um, I'm saying this because, I mean, well, I'll give you the following. I'll give you some arguments as to why I believe this is true. So um, let's talk about Isaac Newton. So as I said... Isaac Newton he was born in uh, I think it Woolsthorpe Manor in Lincolnshire England on Christmas Day 1642 and he lived to be he lived until 1727 now you don't remember the day of his death but anyway christmas day factors in because this guy was so brilliant he was often compared with jesus and so you oftentimes the christmas day comes as a factor because of that isaac newton may have been the most brilliant human being in the last thousand years now, on the day he was born, he was extremely premature. And in fact, uh, his his mother, um, Newton's mother, Hannah Eiskopf, or sorry, Hannah Eiskopf actually, uh, you know, she was only nineteen years old at the time. But, you know, she was, so Newton's father didn't live to see Newton being born. Newton's father died before, before Isaac Newton was actually born. And so Hannah Eiskopf, you know, when, when he had this extremely premature baby, uh, she sent a couple of servant girls down to get some, to fetch some water. And these, these, these girls took their own sweet time because they didn't believe that the baby would actually survive the night. That this is kind of an errand that wasn't really worth having. They fully expected Newton to not even survive their trip to the water. And, and in fact, he did survive that night. He, in fact, he lived to be 84 years old. In fact, he became one of the most influential human beings to ever live. Okay, so Isaac Newton, you know, he, so, you know, he had, you know, estimated 190 to 200 IQ. I mean, he was uh, somebody whose intelligence level was four or five center deviations above the mean. Uh, he also, along with that, you know, along with, you know, when you're, when you have this kind of level of, of intelligence, sometimes it comes with other kind of, you know, it's, nothing's for free. Sometimes you get some, some severe issues. So, you know, Newton was known to have great fits of rage. He was known to have a great amount of anger. He would form enemies, you know, with other scientists. And, you know, and one of the reasons that people point out is that, you know, because, Hannah Hannah was Hannah Eiskopf was a widow. She actually left Isaac Newton when he was a baby. Uh, she married a guy by the name of Barnabas Smith, who was a local rector. Had a, uh, three kids with Barnabas Smith. Barnabas Smith actually died nine years later. Then she decided to come back to Isaac when she was on, when she was when Isaac Newton was already nine years old. Newton never forgave her for that. Newton and in fact Newton developed a hatred for all women if you will i mean it, it, and again that's that's not normal you know that's you know something that's no that's i don't know what kind of you know issue newton had but you know obviously that was a in an individual woman who did this but, but anyway he never married in fact no matter no matter how great his successes were toward the end of his life he said that 
No matter, you know, all the things he's done in his life, there's nothing that he's more proud of than having never been with a woman, you know, intimately. And so this is, you know, this is the kind of person we're dealing with. So when Newton was young, you know, he had no interest in working on the farm. You know, he, his mother was sent, uh, uh, he'd be sent off, you know, to go and, uh, and do do certain things and you know, he'd be sent off to go watch some servants. So Newton would just basically have the servants go do whatever work. He'd go off and, and, and absorb himself in his mathematics and physics. And uh, and then when the servants were done, they'd come and find him. And then they then then uh, they would go back to the to the manor. And so Newton had absolutely no interest. In fact, the servants were just they were, they were annoyed. They thought they thought that he was a fool. And he spent he here he, like, here's a man who has who has the uh, inheritance to have this big farm and he has no interest in it whatsoever. All he wants to do is his, is his physics and his math all day, right? And so, well, luckily, you know, they finally decided that it was probably best for Newton to go back to school. And so, you know, Newton uh, went, to, went to college, at, uh, I believe it was at Cambridge, Cambridge University, where he went to college, yes. And, um, and so, and, and, and in fact, the uh, servants, at the manor were jubilant. They they were so glad to get rid of him. They, I mean, it, for them, it's like he was nothing but a giant, worthless pest, basically. And so, to get you know, get rid of Newton was a, was a good thing because he just was really worthless to the farm. So at so at Cambridge, Newton studied under. Uh, so he, he studied, and he wasn't a, he was not an exceptional student at all, and. You know, he kind of was very competitive. So he'd go and he realized he was, his grades were falling behind. He'd go and he he would uh, start, you know, he'd work really hard and get his grades back up. Then he'd lose interest in school again. And, you know, so he was one of those people that he was only interested in his own stuff, not really interested in being a student. So, well, back in England, they had problems with the plague. Okay. And so, and so you know, it's interesting. I never thought I would really understand, you know, the... Europeans being afflicted by the plague until we have we have this we have this quarantine or this pandemic now, right? So, but in 1665, let's pen this dying. So, in 1665, uh, large parts of England. were shut down due to the plague. And including Cambridge University. Where Newton studied. So Newton had to go home. During that during that time, during the time when he was, you know, quarantined at home, he developed calculus. So Newton developed, it was called, so Newton developed, so at this time, Newton developed calculus. Uh, at the time, he called it the method of fluxions. He called it the method of fluxions. He was 23 years old. Let's see if that fits in there. Yeah. So he was only 23 years old, and he had already developed the foundations of calculus. Newton was very secretive. He didn't want to tell anybody anything he was doing. And in fact, um, you know, and, and so, you know, in his secrets, I mean, he basically, by the time he got back to Cambridge, uh, a lot of the great minds were working on problems that Newton had secretly already solved. But Newton didn't feel like telling people about it. So, you know, again, he, he had some, you know, antisocial behavior, if you will. So he did it for himself. So he had actually, at the age of 23, developed the foundation, foundations of calculus in order for him to be able to understand his physics problems better. Okay, so while still at Cambridge, so when he graduated from Cambridge, he, while he was at Cambridge, he studied under 
a, a person by the name of Isaac Barrow, who himself was a great mathematician. In fact, he held what's called the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics. At the time, the word physics didn't exist. If you were under, if you were interested in nature, that was called natural philosophy. So Isaac Newton studied under Isaac Barrow. And in fact, Isaac Barrow was so extremely impressed with Newton that he basically said, I have met a man who is so much greater than I am. He handed Newton his job. Isaac Barrow stepped aside and Isaac Newton became a very young uh, location chair of mathematics, a very prestigious professorship, one of the greatest schools in the, you know, in the, on the planet. Cambridge University. So here's Isaac Newton, you know, this, this brand new job. And of course, I think it was a, a fair thing. Now, some great, great people have held this professorship. So not only so you had, you had so Isaac Barrow was great, but you had Isaac Newton held, held this job. Um, another person who held the job was Paul Dirac. And he is, a, we refer to him as the father of quantum mechanics. And more recently, Stephen Hawking, who is a great cosmologist. So some pretty amazing names have sat in that, in that, in that office. And so this was given to Isaac Newton. All right. And so now Isaac Newton was an unusual person. So he developed in his own on his own, secretively, he developed, he understood for the first time the law of universal gravitation. He understood the laws of mechanics. And so one day, and he kept this all a secret. One day, um, you know, he happened to be with his best friend, Edmund Halley, Sir Edmund Halley. You, you hear about him with Halley's Comet that comes around every 76 years. Well, he decided, he told Halley some of the stuff that he had done. And Halley's eyes popped out of his head, and he kind of told Newton, you got to tell the world this. And Newton's like, well, why should I? And so Halley finally begged him to, for him to tell the world what he had discovered. And so, of course, Isaac Newton was a workaholic. Isaac Newton was somebody who just didn't do anything lightly. So when Isaac Newton decided to write a book on all of what he discovered, he took 18 months, 18 straight months to write this book. He hardly ever slept. He hardly ever ate. He hardly had human contact. All he would do from day in and day out is work on this book. And finally, in, on, on July 5th, 1687, uh, we have what was called the Philosophe. Naturally, Principia, Mathematica. July 5th, 1687. Basically in English, that is the, uh, the principles of the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. So why is this written in Latin? This is Latin, and I probably didn't pronounce it right. But anyway, um, but it's written in Latin is because that's how scientists spoke to each other. You had a different vernacular. You may speak English, you may speak German, you may speak du or you know Dutch or or French or Spanish. However, when you publish, everybody who was anybody in the scientific world or in the intellectual world also writ, wrote and spoke Latin. So everybody was able to communicate as a common language Latin. 
That was a universal language. So you wrote in Latin. And so essentially you see this whole, uh, so this book is considered to be one of the, the, probably the greatest scientific book ever written. Inside of this book, Newton unveiled for the very first time the three laws of motion. And the universal law of gravitation. Now, many few scientists in their life experience stardom, you know, like being a rock star. Isaac Newton was such a scientist. People wrote poetry about him. People, people compared him, I mean, literally, as I say, they compared him with even Jesus. I mean, this, this level of incredible, unbelievable intellect. You know, the only person I can think of that had such stardom, such rock star stardom was Albert Einstein. So Isaac Newton became, I mean, in fact, he was knighted by Queen Anne. So he was even knighted. He became Sir Isaac Newton. He was later made the master of the Royal Mint. So he, he actually retired from physics in the early 1700s. And one of the things he did is I mean, if, you go, if you go to the Royal Mint in England, you will see a bust of Isaac Newton. Newton was, you know, he was considered an extremely important. He, was, he, was, he, he gained, you know, great affluence. He was considered an extremely important uh, uh, natural uh, national treasure, really, to England. And and you know, one of the things that Isaac Newton did in the Royal Mint is one of the problems they had was with counterfeiters. There's a great recoinage. I can't remember the year, uh, 1696 or whatever I think it was. And Isaac Newton estimated that about 20% of all the coins were counterfeit. And if you if you uh, made counterfeit money, that was considered high treason. And you you would and you would be executed for that. Isaac Newton, you know, had to go against laws, you know, that kind of prevented that. But he became like his own lawyer, judge, jury, executioner. He would actually go and hang out at, at bars and basically disguise himself and dis and and he would get evidence for the people who he, who believe he believed were counterfeiters. And he had twenty six of them executed altogether. So this is the kind of person Isaac Newton. Anything he took. He took with great, great uh, um, concentration and, and fervor. You know, he, he, he didn't do anything lightly. So one of the other great things that Isaac Newton did, besides calculus and the law and, and the Principia, this is oftentimes called the Principia. We don't, we don't go through the whole thing. Oftentimes people refer to it. You can buy this book, actually, at Barnes and & Noble. Um, and, and in the Principia, you don't actually see calculus. Isaac Newton mostly did his uh, proofs in, with geometry. And so, you know, this, uh, he also was, is known for the great, what they're called the calculus wars. So what happened was, you know, basically Isaac Newton, what really happened really, I mean, you can't tell this to Newton, but Isaac Newton and the German polymath Gottfried Leibniz Basically, uh, invented calculus, or let's say derived calculus. I hate to use the word invented. And there was a great war, mostly brought out by Newton. I mean, Leibniz was, was a little bit more psychologically uh, balanced, but uh, Newton was adamant almost like in a war, that he was the first person to did calculus and not Leibniz. And, and, and for, in fact, it turns out that Newton, you know, given that he had done the method of fluxions, you know, at the age of 23, if he had actually published like he should have, there would be no question. But, you know, more or less, history has kind of more, I mean, there, there, are, people, there are great supporters of Leibniz. I, I, I don't know if you ask German, a German person, maybe they might think Leibniz did it, but Anyway, I believe that history history has shown that Newton was the was the first person to calculus. What really happened was the way I look at it is you have two great ideas and they were into, they were developed independently. And this has happened many times. You know, if you look at the you look at say for instance the development of quantum electrodynamics. You know, more in more modern day. Well, 
Well, the Nobel Prize was shared by Richard Feynman. Julian Schwinger. And I may not get this guy's, uh, I think, Sinatiro Tomonaga of Japan. These three guys all de developed quantum electrodynamics independently at the same time. And they all got the Nobel Prize for it. You know, you didn't have Richard Feynman going around saying, oh, you know, you you know, you guys stole it from me. You know, no, they, they all got the Nobel Prize for it because sometimes things are just the idea is right and people develop independently, which I think is what happened. Leibniz was a prodigy. He was reading in his father's library by the time he was three years old. His father was a professor of philosophy. Leibniz was a polymath. Leibniz was was a universal genius like like uh, da Vinci. And so Leibniz was perfectly capable of doing what Newton did. He was like another Newton. He was like a German version of Newton. And so it, so what probably really happened is if there's Nobel Prize back then, Newton and Leibniz probably would have shared it for calculus. I mean, they independently developed. In fact, we used most of not Leibniz notation. When you saw that I told you that the velocity is the change in the position with respect to time, well, these Ds, that's Leibniz notation. We use Leibniz notation in calculus. Newton would say, I don't know if you were to say that, uh, he would call this uh, X prime or something. He uses prime notation. You know, these primes was Newton. You know, and some people do use Newton's notation. But I think that people who really do calculus for a living generally use Leibniz notation. So even though Newton may have gotten the calculus first, I think the better notation is, is what was developed by Gottfried Leibniz. Anyway, um, one more thing about Newton before we proceed into what we're going to talk about here is that Newton also, and you won't see this until Physics 2, Newton also wrote the book on ray optics. So he wrote a book called Optics. And English, anything we usually end with a C, the English will oftentimes put a K there, you know, and and so you see optics with a K. That was basically a book by Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton explained or basically uh, wrote a book on ray optics, which we'll talk about in physics too. But again, here's just another great accomplishment of Isaac Newton. As he became really the, you know, the, the, formal source on optics for many, for more than a century. And people, in fact, people believed, I mean, Newton's, Newton's perspective on light was light was a, a set of particles, uh, called a corpuscular theory. And this prevailed until all the way until like 1865 when, when uh, Maxwell put out the true formal electromagnetic theory. People all were, they're Newtonians. You know, there's a, two groups of people in factions fighting each other on optics, you know, what is light? Is light a particle or sort of wave? Well, Newton felt that it was a particle. So most scientists that basically back Newton's view that light's a particle. Very few uh, believe it was a wave. One of, one of the people who believed it was a wave was one of Newton's contemporaries, a guy by the name of Christian Huygens. But we'll, we'll talk about all that in physics too, for those who take physics too. All right, so anyway, that's all the history I wanna talk about. Again, I, I do this because you know, it's important to I know who Isaac Newton is. So really, I guess one more one more statement. You know, when we talk about science and we live in a in a world of technology, you know, you always hear about people talking about STEM, right? You know, this they call it S T E M. And what STEM stands for? Well, S stands for science, T for technology. E for engineering, M for mathematics, right? Well, you really ought to spell it like this. I mean, granted, STEM is a cute word that people can sell, right? But really what comes first is math. And then when you have math, then you have science, the S should come after the, the M. And then finally, 
when you when when you basically when you when you have a scientific theory, you're able to make things from it. You're able to develop uh, 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 machinery, and that be, that's called engineering. So that's called making something from science. And finally, when you live in a world where you have all these different machines, that's called technology. So quite honestly, it should be M-S-E-T. That doesn't spell that doesn't spell anything, but that's really we call it STEM because it spells something. But really, math mathematics is the foundation. From mathematics, you get scientific theories. From science, you get to make things. That's called engineering. And when you live in a world where, all, where you have uh, uh, you know a bunch of uh, engineered devices and technology, and that, that's called that's called technology. All right. And so the fact that we live. I mean, pretty much everybody since Newton's time. If you if you use technology and you live in a world full of technology, this all started from the Principia. This all started from Isaac Newton. And why? Because of the laws of physics. You wouldn't have science. You would not have science without the laws of physics. So when I talk about Isaac Newton being possibly the most uh, influential person in history, that's my argument for that. And I think it's a pretty sound argument. All right, so let's talk about what Newton particularly did. So in this in this chapter, we talk about the laws of physics, all right? And so, so first of all, we need to develop, uh, well, let's just start with laws of physics. So Newton's first law. And I'll write it out in its English, and then we'll, we'll we'll talk about it. So officially, it's Newton's first law of motion. Okay, and the way it is written in English is a body at rest. A body at rest remains at rest. Or, if in motion, remains in motion at constant velocity. Unless acted on by an ex a net external force. All right, so we have to talk about what a force is in a moment. But essentially, you know, what's a force? We can think of right now a force as basically right now a push or a pull. All right, and then you know again we'll we'll get you know and then and then, and in fact it is a vector. We'll talk about forces uh, more uh, specifically in a moment. However, what this tells you is that there is something called inertia, and inertia. One of the ways we can one one of the ways we can actually uh, one measure of inertia is called the mass. We don't know in a time of, we know today that a mass is the amount of matter that an object has. We understand today what atoms are. In Newton's times, they did not know that. In fact, we did not know, we did not have an experimental evidence for atoms until 1830. And so all we really know is that mass is a measure of inertia. All right. So again, what does this say? A body at rest remains at rest, or if in motion, remains in motion at constant velocity, unless acted on by a net external force. That inertia basically means that it is the tendency for a body to continue what it's doing. So I'm going to erase this. Yeah, this is the official legalese definition of what uh, what a. Uh, 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 Verbiage of Newton's first law. Okay, so let me erase all this. 
And we know that mass is a measure of inertia. All right, so let's talk about, let's try to understand what this means. All right, so inertia is the tendency for a body to continue what it is doing. The more mass a body has, the more inertia it has. So as the saying goes, you know, a boulder has a lot more inertia than a basketball. So if you have a boulder, let's just say a boulder's at rest. You know, we know a boulder has a lot more mass than a basketball, right? If a boulder's at rest, it's a lot harder to try to change that situation and move it than, say, if you have a basketball rest. A lot easier to move a basketball. On the other hand, if a boulder's coming at you and you try to deflect it, it's way harder. You're going to have a lot, a lot harder time trying to deflect that boulder then if a basketball is coming at you, you want to deflect it. All right. And so, again, that's, you know, that's the concept of inertia. Now, one, uh, I would say, good example of inertia is why you wear a seatbelt in a car. So, a seatbelt in a car... protects against inertia or protects against Newton's first law. So for instance, let's say you're in a car, you're an occupant in a car and you don't have your seatbelt on. Okay. Now let's say the car is going at 70 miles per hour. And all of a sudden, you have to slam on the brakes or you hit somebody. Let's say you're not looking and the driver's not looking and he slams into a truck. Now, the car is going to come to a very abrupt stop. However, you, the occupant, your body, is perfectly happy doing what it's doing. It wants to continue doing what it's doing. What's it doing? Well, it's going 70 miles per hour down the freeway. See, it's going to continue doing that. And, of course, something's got to stop your body. I mean, for you to have a change, there has to be an external force. Well, it's either your seatbelt or it's the windshield, right? And so something's got to stop you. So, again, this tendency for inertia is something that is a behavior of the universe. We do not know why it is true. It is a behavior of the universe that has no primary cause. Objects have inertia. Okay. Newton was able to understand this. In fact, Newton's understanding, his physical intuition was, was so incredible that, you know, he understood forces and stresses and strains so much. There's a, there's actually, he actually was very good at making things with his hands. He'd make, you know, water clocks and he'd make machines with wood. In fact, um, there's a bridge in, around, in, around Cambridge University. It's called the Mathematical Bridge. It is made is made entirely with no nails, and it's still around today. Newton had such an incredible understanding of the stresses and the strains in the wood that you know even you know he was able to build a bridge without nails. That's all. That's his physical intuition. So he had such an incredible deep intuition about about nature. You now you look later on, and you know, I talked to you about thermodynamics. You now here's Newton sitting by himself, comes up with the three laws of motion in the right order. If you look at thermodynamics, you notice that there's a kind of a funny nomenclature that the lowest law is the zeroth law. 
we had probably six or seven or eight or, or more great physicists, thermodynamicists, working on thermodynamics. And among all of them, they missed a lot. I think it was Rudolf Clausius who kind of later said, hey, guys, um, I think we missed a law. You know, when we take a temperature, that's actually part of a, that's really the manifestation of a law of physics that we kind of were left, left out. And so they were already talking about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So what do you do now? This particular law, taking a temperature is the most basic thing you can do in thermodynamics. So you can't call it the third law because it doesn't make any sense because, it, you know, it, it, the first and second laws depend on it. So they had to, they had to come up with the zeroth law. So among all these scientists, all these great thermodynamicists, they forgot a law of physics. Here's Newton working by himself. He gets them all correct and in the right order. So that's, that's you know, that's incredible. Now, now, if we talk about the concept of mass, today we know, again, it's a amount of matter in a body. Right now, it's nothing but a measure of inertia. Okay, now, we go to the second law. Now, we talk about forces. We're going to talk a lot about forces in a moment. But now that we know inertia, the second law is basically a miracle. So the Newton's second law And I say the best way to write it is in a mathematical sense. All right. And so, first of all, it's a con it requires, first of all, the concept of a system. So let's talk about a system first. What is a system? Newton's second law acts on a system. Just imagine a system being a car. So I have a car, and I don't, I don't drive very well, so we'll come to find out. So I'll draw this little car here, right? And inside of this car, door here, whatever. Inside of this car are uh, people. Yeah. Try to put a back seat too. <laughs> All right, inside here are people, right? So you got people inside this car, and um, and so. In this car, you might have air resistance. We call that drag. Um, we'll talk later about this force called the normal force. And uh, we'll talk about uh, weight. And say engine thrust. All right. And so... Um, Give me one second here. So, in this system, yeah, I define the system as my system is the car plus the occupants. Okay, so the car plus the occupants form my system. External forces, external forces. Okay, we're talking about you know let's be let's be very uh, specific about this. External forces are forces that act on my system. So they would be forces like the drag force of the air resistance on the car, the thrust of the engine, the weight of the car plus the occupants, the normal force, which we haven't talked about yet, what's the force of the ground pushing up on the car. Okay, those are the external forces. Um, internal forces we don't care about. So you might have, you know, kids in the back seat pulling on each other. Those are, those are internal forces. We don't care about internal forces. We care about external forces. So that's what forces on my system. So be very specific about that. Newton's second law talks about external forces. All right. So, now, so again, it's a, it's a law about a system. Once you define your system. So let's erase this and we'll state what Newton's second law is officially. So Newton's second law 
says, I'll write this in the most mathematical form first. The summation of all forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. All right, and so summation of all forces is the mass times the acceleration. Now, let's look at this law carefully. What we're seeing here, now let's, let's remind ourselves here for a moment, one second. We see this symbol, in case you haven't seen it before. This is a Greek capital S. Okay, a little s would, would look like that. That's a Greek little s. This is called sigma. Again, physicists need the Greek alphabet. That's called sigma, all right? And so we typically use the capital S in Greek, the sigma, to represent summations. So let me just kind of, as an aside, uh, if I were to say, for instance, the sum, let's say, for instance, I have a set of data. I'll say I have a set of data. I'll say I have a set of data X sub I. And let's just say that that data is going to be, I don't know, 1, 3, 4, 6, 8. And I might say that my I is an index. It's a counting number, right? It just labels it. So I'll say... This is labeled number one. This is labeled number two, three, four, five. This is my index label. So if I were to say the summation of X sub I, I ranges from one to how many are we got? Five, one to five. It means my index value will take on values from one to five. What am I really doing here? I'm saying that that's going to be x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x sub 5. My indexes, right? So that might be, that's equivalent to say 1 plus 2. I'm sorry. 1 plus, my, my set is up here. 1 plus 3 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8. All right. Let's see here. 1 plus 3 is 4, plus 4 is 8. 8 plus 6 is 14, and another 8 is 22. So all of that will come out to be a number, right? So, again, this is no fancy notation, compact notation to say that I'm adding a bunch of things up. Okay? Just, I mean, if you, you've seen it before or you haven't seen it before, I just want to, you know, a little dinky mathematical review, right? So what am I saying here? So on the left-hand side of Newton's second law, this is a fancy way of saying that I'm adding, I'm adding vectors. I'm adding a bunch of forces that are acting on the system. So in reality, I could say that this is the net force or the resultant force equal to mass times acceleration. So let's look at this for a moment. The left-hand side of this equation is telling me that I'm adding forces just like I would in a vector's lab. It's just the addition of forces, external forces to the system. That's it. The right-hand side connects with the kinematics that we said with Galileo. Okay, so this is the same acceleration that we talked about in chapters two and three. This is kinematics. That's the acceleration. And so again, written in English, this is sum of all force vectors. Sum of all external forces. And that's a vector addition. Equals the mass of the system times its acceleration. And that's what it is. That's what it says. This is, and then what's what's tying everything together? What we learned from Newton's first law, a measure of inertia. 
So this is a miracle. This does not have to be true. This is the behavior of the universe that is always true, and we've never, ever have seen an exception to it. That if you sum all the forces on a system, this is just nothing but a vector sum of forces. That's the left-hand side. The right-hand side is kinematics, the acceleration, and they're linked together via inertia, the mass. So if you see an object accelerate, you, mu you know there must, be, there must be a net force of being applied to it. And vice versa, if you apply a net force to an object, it will accelerate. So it's a converse two-way relationship in this law. It is always true. This is one of the fundamental hinge pins of all of mechanics. This is one of the most important equations in all of physics. Newton's second law. And again, this is, does not have to be true. There's no reason that this has to be true. It just is. It is a fundamental statement of the universe. It is a fundamental uh, concept of how the universe works. Now, what are the units of this force? Well, let's look at it. We know about, so we know the mass has a units of kilograms, right, and SI units. And we know the acceleration has units of meters per second squared. You put it together, you have a, units of force. It's units of mass times units of, and this is going to be uh, units of acceleration. Or it's going to be basically kilograms, meters per second squared. When you see that combination of units, that is called a Newton in honor of, of course, Isaac Newton. And we typically will refer to this by the capital N. In the English system, we have pounds. That's funny that... We say the English system. I had a couple of uh, students from England in my class about a year ago, and they, they thought that was interesting how I said that. They said, oh, we refer to that as imperial. But anyway, in the English system, we have, I mean, Americans call it the English system. We have pounds, and that's labeled LB. So that's the force in the English system. That's the system we use in the United States primarily. Typically, in the uh, in our system, we will we will work in terms of newtons. You know, and professionally, scientists work in terms of newtons. If you have an American customer, of course, as I said before, you will convert to pounds at the end. Okay. So, with that, I want to talk. I want to do a couple of problems on Newton's second law. Just kind of get get out there because you know this is nothing but words until you actually work some problems and understand how it works. So this works some Newton's second law problems. All right, so Newton's second law. I wanna work Cutnell and Johnson. Again, I, don't, I didn't see any good problems out of OpenStack, so I'm just gonna go straight to Cutnell and Johnson. Cutnell and Johnson 4.2. All right, Cutnell and Johnson 4.2 says, a boat. Um, has a mass of 6,800 kilograms. Okay. Um, its engines generate a drive force of 4,100 newtons. And that'll be due west. While the wind exerts a force. Of. 
800 newtons. Due east. And the water exerts a resistive force of 1,200 newtons due east. Are the magnitude and direction of the boat's acceleration. All right. One thing about cutting on Johnson, the problems are wordy. What are the magnitude and direction of if I'm still on the camera? Yes, the boat's acceleration. All right, so what I'm being basically told, I'm starting off with a nice basic one-dimensional problem, east and west, all right? And so I'm told that a boat has a mass of 6,800 kilograms. That's the mass of the boat. Its engines generate a drive force of 4,100 newtons due west, while the wind exerts a force of 800 newtons due east, and the water exerts a resistive force of 1,200 newtons due east. What are the magnitude and direction of the boat's acceleration? So note that, and then I'm going to have to, of course, erase the board to do this problem. All right, so hopefully you got that all down. I'm going to erase now. This is actually a fairly easy problem, particularly since it's essentially a one-dimensional problem. <clears throat> so what am I being told? Well, let's always draw a picture, you know. Drawing a picture is very important. So what would I do? Well, I would generally have a, you know, a, a Cartesian coordinate system. And I would say north, south, east, west. Of course, I don't want to use those coordinates. I instead want to use um, plus x, negative x, plus y, negative y. I prefer to use those coordinates, right? So, so essentially, though, I, I I really only have forces going west and east. So I'm being told that I have an engine thrust force. I'll call it T. So it's a vector, negative 4100 newtons x hat. That is the engine thrust. I put I put T for thrust. For lack of a better thing. Okay, and again, it's it's negative x hat. It's negative x, right? Um, I will say the wind. I'll call that w, for lack of a better thing. The wind, w vector, is positive 800 newtons x hat. That's the wind force. Force due to the wind. It's, it's blowing east. And I'll say c for current. And I'll say that that's positive 1,200 newtons x hat. And that's the current, the water current, all right? And the mass is 6,800 kilograms of this big boat. So I now have a bunch of forces and a mass. Now I'm able to try to work this out. How do I do it? Well. I will use Newton's second law. And that is the sum of all forces is mass times acceleration. Well, what are my forces? I mean, again, I, I mean, I, I will sum of all forces. Now, again, one of the things to point out is that every vector equation it can be expressed by one or more scalar equations. In general, I can I can always write the sum of all forces in the x direction is mass times acceleration in the x direction. Notice I've taken the hats off. 
I, I use, you essentially apply the law, or apply the vector equation in scalar forms in every, and it's true in every single scalar dimension independently. So I can write the sum of all forces in the x direction is mass times acceleration in the x direction. I can write that the sum of all forces, if, if applicable, in the y direction is mass times acceleration in the y direction. And I could write the sum of all forces, in the, if, if applicable, in the z direction is mass times acceleration in the z direction, if applicable. So every single vector equation is equivalent to one or more scalar equations. And we'll notice here that, yes, we are constantly talking about Cartesian system. We're talking about the XYZ system, right? That's just one particular system. There are actually eight orthogonal systems. Now, I haven't actually in my entire career ever seen more than three. Um, I have seen, obviously, the Cartesian system, XYZ. Uh, in the next chapter, I will actually... Uh, expose you to the spherical court, uh, polar coordinate system. That would be called R theta phi. And you could hypothetically do a cylindrical system, and that would be uh, generally R phi z. You know, and again, I'll, we'll see these. I mean, z being a, a height. Now, why do you choose a coordinate system? Again, we choose a coordinate system because it's convenient to us. We're just observers. Why not choose something that's convenient? So, you know, if you see something has spherical symmetry, then like a planet going around the sun, why not use a why not use a spherical system? It's more convenient. Why would you complicate things by using X, Y, Z? Or if you're if you're looking at, you know, uh, something going on with a soda can or something, you know, a bug walking around the side of a soda can. Well, you're best off using a cylindrical coordinate system. Again, it's best for us. And well, in fact, we'll see later on that. In, a very, in this very lecture, we're going to see that we're going to actually use a coordinate system that's slanted. We're going to talk about objects rolling, um, sliding on an inclined plane. We'll use a tilted coordinate system because it's best for us, right? And so, again, this is a generalized vector equation. It is agnostic to any coordinate system. You have not committed yourself with this equation, sum of all forces and equals mass times acceleration, when you see the equation written in vector form, that is a generalized law of physics. And it, and it is not in any way attached to a particular coordinate system. You have the choice of picking whatever orthogonal coordinate system you wish to work in. I have chosen here to choose the Cartesian system. So I will then express these, this, uh, these laws of physics. I'll express this equation in scalar form in particular to the coordinates of the system that I have chosen. Okay, again, that's a choice that I have to make. All right, so again, I'm just making that point. In this particular problem, we really only care about the X directions. That's the only one that really matters. You know, so I'm choosing Cartesian, and the only thing that's going on is X directions. So I'm gonna erase this. I hope you remember it, put in your notes, take notes while you're with me, I'm, I need space. Limited whiteboard, as I've said many times. So how do I work this equation out? Well, I'm going to take note, particularly, you know, I'm going to essentially say that, well, I can write this out. Let's see. Sum of all forces in the x direction. What is that? Well, that's going to be the thrust plus the wind plus the current, T plus W plus C. And that's going to equal mass times acceleration. I don't, I can just drop the x right now. This is a one-dimensional problem. So I don't really need to worry about hats and the, and the subscripts so much. I'm really in a one dimension at this point. I got to be very careful, though, about direction, because direction in, in one dimension is a plus or minus sign. The thrust, I was told, is going west. So that would be negative 4,100 newtons. The wind, I'm being told, is 800 newtons to the right, and the current is 1,200 newtons to the right. And that's equal to what? That's equal to the uh, mass. Um, actually, you know what? It's violating my rules here. Uh, let's solve for acceleration first. So acceleration would be T plus W plus C all divided by M. Remember, do all the algebra, solve for the unknown, and then put in your numbers, right? So I was violating my own rules. Okay, now we're ready. I've done as much algebra as I possibly can do. Now, <clears throat> remember, T is negative 4,100 newtons. 
plus, you know, let's write this below. We're out of space. All right, let's see if I stay in the camera. A, negative 4,100 newtons plus 800 newtons plus 1,200 newtons, all divided by 6,800 kilograms. When I do all that, I will come up with the answer that A is equal to negative 0 0.309 meters per second squared. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to erase this diagram up here for the purposes of real estate. All right, A is negative 0 0.309 meters per second squared. Again, if I'm dealing with newtons and kilograms, then I can be assured that my acceleration's in SI, meters per second squared. What's that negative mean? Well, I can write that in alternative form. A is 0 0.309, remember it's a big ship, meters per second squared due west. Negative means due west. So I have an alternative ways of writing this answer. I can either express it, I mean, and again, if you were taking an exam and you wrote that diagram for me, and you told me, yes, I know it's uh, my axes are north, south, east, and west. However, I am calling that plus x minus x plus y minus y. Well, if you told me what plus x minus x plus y minus y meant and you wrote that as an answer, then I'm perfectly okay with that. You've, you have shown me what that means. Um, and you can also convert back to what the original form of the problem was and that we're talking about north, north south, east, west. And so this is really going to say that it's due west. Okay, so I was given forces, I was given the mass, I was able to calculate the acceleration. Again, I got an acceleration, why? Because of the application of forces, and it's really the net force that matters. Overall net force is what matters. All the forces, their overall net force is what, caused, what drives the acceleration. All right, um, let's see. Go further, so I got Cutnell Johnson 4.4. All right, and that one says, in the amusement park, ride. Known as, known as Magic Mountain Superman. Just north of Los Angeles, I used to go to that park. Um, powerful magnets accelerate a car. From rest to 45 meters per second. or about 100 miles per hour. In a time of 7.0 seconds. The combined mass of the car and riders is 5.5 and send the third kilograms. Find the average net force exerted on the car and riders by the magnets. All right, getting a little bit more 
a little bit, you know, incrementally more advanced. So I got to do some uh, do some kinematics in order to find the acceleration. So in the in the amusement park ride known as Magic Mountain Superman, powerful magnets accelerate a car from rest to 45 meters per second, about 100 miles per hour, in a time of 7.0 seconds. The combined mass of the car and riders is 5.5 and 10 to the third kilograms. Find the average net force exerted on the car and riders by the magnets. Okay, so take that in. So what do I have to do here? Well, I have been told the mass. I want to find the force. So I need to, I, so I need to find what the acceleration is. Again, I, I have no idea what the force I, I guess all the forces are going to be the magnets. However, you know, there's... You know, there's gravity and other weight and other stuff that deal with you know deal with it, but I, I don't really care because if I know the acceleration and I know the mass, then whatever the net force is, that's the magnitude of it, and I don't really have to worry about force analysis, right? And so, what in this problem, I have to actually do kinematics to find the acceleration now. So it's not just given to me like the last problem. Right, I'm going to erase this now. All right, so let's again as we show our work, uh, let's write down how to do this problem. What am I told? Well, I mean told that V naught is zero. Why? The car and riders start from rest, right? So start from rest. That's why I can say that. That's written in the in the language, in the in the problem. I mean told that the final velocity is 45 meters per second. I mean, told that the time in which this acceleration occurs is 7.0 seconds, and the mass of the car, plus the system, basically, is going to be 5.5 times 10 to the third kilogram. This is all what I've been given. And what do I? And and I also. Um, and what do, what do I want? I want the net force. So that's really all, all those words, all that, all that English, essentially break it all down to this. This is what I know. So I have to figure out the acceleration because what am I really after? I'm really after that the net force, I'm really after Newton's second law. Net force is mass times acceleration. That's what I really want to do. Um, I want this. I'm given the mass. I, I'm not yet given the acceleration. I don't know the acceleration. Yet. I got to go and do a little bit of work, a little bit of scratch work to find that. So what do I do? Well, I got to go back to chapter two, and let's see what's probably a good equation to pick out of my catalog. Well, how about v equals v naught plus a t? And by the way, v naught is zero because the car starts from rest. So I can quickly solve this algebra problem. And I find that a is just nothing but v over t. Okay. Well, v is forty-five meters per second. And the time is seven seconds. So I find out that the acceleration is going to be 6.4 meters per second squared, about two thirds G. Can't have it be too hard or else people will get sick. All right, so 6.4 meters per second squared. So it's about two thirds G. All right, and so what I want to do now, now that I know this, and this simple matter of saying F net is now going to be 5.5 times 10 to the third kilograms times, if I can say in the board here, 6.4 meters per second squared. Yep, great. The net force is equal to 3.52. times 10 to the fourth Newton. That's a big force. So again, you're taking a very large mass and accelerating it to uh, two thirds G, G being 9.8 meters second squared in only seven seconds. So that's that takes quite a bit of force by those magnets to do that. It's a little maglev train, if you will, over there in Magic Mountain. So I used to live north of Los Angeles, and so that was a big, big attraction in my in my town. It was it's in a town called Santa Clarita, over in uh, just north of Los Angeles. 
Okay, so I lived uh, about a five minute drive from that place. All right, so let's continue on. And that's in California. All right, um, let's look at Cutnell Johnson 4.13. All right, moving on here. So what does that say? A rocket of mass uh, 4.50 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. <clears throat> is in flight. Its thrust is directed at an angle uh, 55.0 degrees above the horizontal. It has a magnitude of 7.50 times 10 to the 6 newtons. Find the magnitude and direction of the rocket's acceleration. Um, give the direction as an angle above the horizontal. All right. Okay, so read this. Cutting up Johnson 4.13, a rocket of mass 4.50 to the 75th kilograms is in flight. So you have a rocket in flight. Its thrust is directed at an angle of 55.0 degrees above the horizontal. So it's going above the horizontal, if you call this a horizontal, 55 degrees, roughly. Um, it has a magnitude of 7.50 to the 76 newtons. Okay, that's the force. That's telling us all about the force. That's great. We, got, we have the mass. Find the magnitude and direction of the rocket's acceleration. Give the direction as an angle uh, above the horizontal. I kind of wrote my letters together here. Angle above. All right. So essentially, it wants us to give us the acceleration that's going to be. Some at some angle above the horizontal. No, it's not gonna. It's not gonna be fifty-five degrees. Okay, and why is that? Because we have to factor in gravity. Gravity is a force. All right, and so, so let's do the problem. So again, a rocket of mass is forty-four point five zero ten to fifth kilograms is in flight. Its thrust is directed at an angle of fifty-five point zero degrees above the horizontal and has a magnitude of seven point five zero times ten to the six newtons. Find the magnitude and direction of the rocket's acceleration. Give the direction as an angle above, <laughs> sorry guys, an angle above the horizontal. It's a good thing I read it one more time. All right, there we go. So I'm going to erase it now. Give you a moment. Okay, so I, <clears throat> I'm going to work the problem now. So again, we're going to get progressively harder and harder as we go along. You know, we start off easy and go get a little bit more challenging. So we're on Cutting Johnson 13 now. So again, this is your actual textbook. All right, so again, what is, so what, 
what, what do I have going on? Well, I have, let's always draw a picture so I have an idea of what's actually happening. I have x hat or plus x, negative x, plus y, negative y. And I have a force that's specified. And again, I'll, I'll actually I'll call it a thrust force. I'll call it T for engine thrust. Okay. And it's at an angle of theta equals 55.0 degrees. I mean, that's basically what I have. And I'm also given the mass. So I'm given the mass of this rocket is 4.50 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. That's the mass. Theta is 55.0 degrees. So I'm given that. And I will call this the engine thrust. I'm given the magnitude of the thrust of 7.50 times 10 to the sixth newtons. And this, again, all the words I just got done writing down, this is really what the translation is. I always tell, I used to teach uh, math back when I was in California, uh, professor of mathematics out there. And I'd always tell my students, I would tell them that you have to do an English to algebra translation. Mathematics is a language, as I've said. So you got the English, which is a language, and you translate it into mathematics. So this is all those words I wrote in that big paragraph. This is what I wrote down in a math in a, in a mathematical sense. All right. So how do I do this? Well, I, I start off with Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is our go-to. And what is that? Well, it's going to be the sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration. That is a generalized vector equation for Newton's second law. But as I've said, that's equivalent to one or more scalar equations. So I will have an equation, sum of all forces in the x direction. Take the hat off. Is mass times acceleration in the x direction. I will also have the sum of all forces in this problem in the y direction is mass times acceleration in the y direction. Notice I don't have a m sub x and an m sub y, right? Because why? Because mass is a scalar. Mass has no direction. Mass is the same in, in, in any given direction, right? So the vectors in this problem are the force and the acceleration, right? Mass is the same in all the coordinates. You know, just as a, hopefully that's obvious to you, but in case it isn't. So there you go. So I got to work this out. All right. And so let me erase what I have here. And um, work out these equations. So I have to work out each coordinate, and I got to kind of put everything together. All right. So let me work out the x coordinate first. So again, um, I should probably have not erased that diagram. Let's get that diagram. Let me put the diagram over here. All right. So I have the thrust, and I have theta, all right? So there's my diagram, and I have plus x minus x plus y minus y, all right? There's my diagram. All right, so working to my diagram, I want to talk about the x direction. So what I want to do is... I want to draw what's called a free body diagram. All right, so a free body diagram basically means that, you know, I extract, I just consider a body and all forces on it. Essentially, I take the body out of the universe and I say, I don't care about anything else. I just want to know about what are the forces on that body. So if I imagine this is my mass, this is my mass M, all right? What forces are on M? Well, I, I have the thrust, clearly, but what other forces are on M? Again, I'm, I'm not going to consider air resistance. So only other forces on M is the weight. And we'll find out that Weight 
is the mass times gravity. And I'll, I'll prove this a little bit later. But if you want to find the weight of something, it is given by the mass times the gravity. All right, and I'll prove this here in a moment. So that's how you take a body's weight. So that's so the weight, mg, is pulling down. Mass times gravity. So everything has a weight. Mass times gravity. Again, it's force equals mass times acceleration. What acceleration? G. Right? So again, it's a particular. So, so again, gravity is a force. It's pulling down on you. So we know that force is always mass times acceleration. For a particular acceleration, the acceleration of gravity, that's g. Again, this is not this is not a variable. G is not a variable. It looks like a variable because it's a letter. G is actually a number. It's equal to 9.80 meters per second squared. It looks like a variable, but it is not. So there's a particular weight that's being pulled down on a rocket. So the rocket has is under the influence of two different forces. A thrust force going at an angle 55 degrees or angle theta above the horizontal and a weight that's going straight down negative y hat. All right. So what I have to do now is look at Newton's second law in each coordinate. So let's look at the x coordinate. Sum of all forces in the x direction is mass times acceleration in the x direction. Hmm. Well, what are the forces in the x direction? Well, gravity does not work in the x direction. The only force that is on this rocket in the x direction is the x component of the thrust. Remember what that is? That's T cosine theta. Again, this is this is the hypotenuse, this is the adjacent. So the only, and again, I have to I have to be very careful about orientation. Plus x, minus x, plus y, minus y. All right. And so I gotta say that this is actually gonna be plus. T cosine theta. Again, the left-hand side of the equation, all I am doing is adding forces. And the only force that I see in this picture in the x direction is the x component of the thrust. All right? Equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. All right? And so I can, so I can work this out, and I can say, okay, well, the acceleration in the x direction is going to simply be T cosine theta divided by M. That's what it would be. All right. And then, so we have this. So I'll just write this right now. And we'll kind of store it. A sub X is, is can I, I have my limit, limited whiteboard space. So A sub X is T cosine theta all divided by M. Okay, so I'm going to erase what I got done doing for real estate issues. So, again, there, there's the result from applying Newton's second law in the x direction. I have one more coordinate in this problem. That's the y coordinate. So, I got to apply Newton's second law in the y direction. So, sum of all forces in the y direction is mass times acceleration in the y direction. Again, that's a sub y, a sub y. All right, so what are the forces in the y direction? Let's be very careful about sign. Well, here I have the y, com y component of the, of the uh, engine thrust. What is that again? Again, that is the opposite over at pond. Is that, again, that, remember that? That's T sine of theta. And is that positive or negative? Well, it's positive because... It's basically, what's, what's the thrust doing? It's pushing, it's pulling to the right, which is positive X, and it's pulling up, which is positive Y. So that would be positive. Again, very important. So again, pause. I'm going to be very explicit here and write plus. T sine theta. But that's not the only force in the Y direction. It is also influenced by gravity. In fact, there's no trigonometry needed for gravity. It's just straight down. So minus mg. No, not just G. G is an acceleration. MG is the force. So again, I'm, I'm adding and subtracting forces. And it's minus because it's going down. That's the left-hand side. All I'm doing is adding forces. That's all I do on the left-hand side. And the right-hand side says that's mass times the acceleration in the Y direction. And so I can quickly solve for this, and I find out that A, so I'll just write it up here, that A sub Y, what am I going to do? Well, 
all I really have to do is take all this stuff and divide by m. So it's going to be t sine theta minus mg all divided by m. Those are the two equations that I need for this problem. Now what I can do, what am I being asked? Well, I'm being asked to you know what the acceleration is. Well, I have the acceleration. Now I just got to plug in numbers. So let's do that. A sub x is going to equal, uh, oops, I'm a little bit too far to the left here. A sub x is equal. All right, so let's plug in our numbers here. We have, actually I'll put it up here. A sub x is t cosine theta divided by m. All right. I was told that the thrust is 7.50. Again, go look back your notes. 7.50. I'll get it a little bit lower. A sub x. I was given the thrust 7.50 times 10 to the 6 newtons. All right. Cosine of 55 degrees. That's all divided by M. And I told the mass of this rocket is 4.50 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. All right, if I work that out, I find out that A sub X, I'll just write it up here. If I work this out, I'll find out that A sub X is going to equal um, 9.56 meters per second squared. Okay, so again, I work this out, 7.50 to 10 to 6 newtons times cosine of 55 degrees, all divided by 4.50 to 10 to 5th kilograms. I found out that my, my A sub X, my X component of the acceleration vector is 9.56 meters per second squared. That's, that's almost G. Okay, now let's work out the Y component. And I have that expression ready for me right here. So a sub y will be, again, the, ten, the, the uh, thrust. Again, that's going to be uh, 7.50 times 10 to the 6 newtons times the sine of 55 degrees. I'm going to erase this stuff over here. Okay, and we're going to have um, minus the mass, which is going to be uh, four point um, well, actually, what I can actually what I can do, I can do one better than this. I'm going to take this equation and I'm just going to divide everything through by the masses. I think it's nicer to look at this way. A sub y is t over m sine theta minus g, all right? So all I did is I divided each term by m. I got rid of this. So you can see that there's accelerations here. I think that's probably easier to see. So in this case, A sub y is gonna be the 7.50 times 10 to the sixth newtons divided by the mass, the mass is 4.50 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. And that's gonna be sine of 55, that whole fraction multiplied by the sine of 55 degrees minus 9.80 meters per second squared. And if I do that, I find that A sub Y is going to be 3.85 meters per second squared, all right? So I have now, I now have an A sub X and an A sub Y. I now have the two, I have numerical values for the two components of the acceleration, all right? And again, what I, what I can see is making this assumption, I clearly have an acceleration that's in the first quadrant. All right, and so there's nothing that's negative. I mean, if this was negative, it would be it would imply 
that I had some kind of other quadrant uh, going in the system. But both of these are first quadrant. I assume first quadrant, and I'm right because both of my both of my uh, components are positive. All right. So I have. So now what I really just have is a, is to is to do some vector math. So I'm going to erase all this other stuff. I now have what I need. I've gone through the the, the actions of getting the acceleration. So now I actually have an acceleration vector. And it is in first quadrant. And I'll just call another variable. Um, I'll just call this alpha. And you know, I already used theta. So that's the Greek letter A, for, for instance. So again, in Greek, A that we know is, is uh, capital A in Greek. And we already we already know that, and we call this little a. That's little a in Greek. Again, this was called alpha. You'll see this a lot. I, I'm just pulling this variable out of the blue. I need another variable. I've already used theta, right? So <clears throat> all I'm gonna do. So I'll, what I do know is I know a sub y, and I know a sub x and so i was given this problem as a force you know i was given it in terms of forces with magnitude and direction i was told what the thrust was i was told it was 55 degrees above the horizontal so it is it is uh, customary or conventional for me to give the answer back the way i got it so I should give the I should give you the acceleration back in terms of magnitude and direction. So, so I will do so. So I got to find out what these components are. Well, um, I have to figure out what a is. So the magnitude a again we use Pythagorean theorem. We've seen this before. Square root of a sub x squared plus a sub y squared. Square root a is the square root of nine point. Five six meters per second squared, quantity squared plus three point eight five meters per second squared, quantity squared. Take the square root of all of that sum. So I add these in my calculator. Take the square root. I found out that the magnitude A is ten point three one meters per second squared. That's my magnitude of my acceleration. I'll write it up here. For real estate purposes. All right, let me uh, erase this. Now I have to find the angle. And again, I cannot assume that I just, you know, now that I know the hypotenuse, like sine, cosine, and tangent now become available to me. But again, you make the assumption that you aren't given, you're, you don't come into the problem with the hypotenuse, you just come with the X and Y components. So what do I do? Well, again, I, I apply the tangent. I'm, and again, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I've done this a few times already, look at previous videos. But again, as I say, I do the inverse tangent of the opposite over the adjacent. All right, opposite of alpha is, oh, I'm sorry, not the theta, but alpha. Alpha, so used to writing theta. Opposite, in this case, it's a sub y, and the adjacent's a sub x. Now, you know, as you saw in the vector video, I had an example where I had x over y. I had a different kind of, I had some angle that was, you know, with respect to the y axis, right? But so it's, it's always remember it's opposite over adjacent. You know, mo most of the times in my class, it's going to be a y over x, but don't, you know, again, don't just remember it that way. All right, so alpha is the inverse tangent. Of okay, um, a sub y is 3.85 meters per second squared divided by 9.56 meters per second squared. If I work that out, I find out that alpha is going to be 21.9 degrees. So gravity does have quite an effect, it's nowhere close to 55 degrees. All right, so my final answer. For my acceleration for this problem will be that the acceleration is 
meters per second squared at 21.9 degrees above the horizontal. That's my answer. Okay, gravity comes into play. That's why it's not 55 degrees. Like you might automatically, you know, maybe guess. Okay, let's um, continue on. Again, the best way to do physics problem, best way to understand physics is do problems, right? So I'm going to erase this and I'm going to work another problem out. I'm going to do Cutnell Johnson 4.19. 4.19. Okay, so a lot of words in this one. Let's see how many more problems I want to do here. Yeah, all right. 4.19 is a, is a lengthy one. We're getting progressively more difficult, and this one you're you're probably going to find is real difficult. So this kind of again, you know, there are situations. This is what I always tell people. You know, in physics, you'll find out that some problems are lengthy. Some problems might take three pages to do, and you might you, you might find that to be you know uh, intimidating. But I always tell people, you know, most things in your life are like that. Let's say you want to go to a Ranger ball game, baseball game. Well, what do you got to do? Well, you got to go. You got to go get yourself ready. Then you got to go into your car. Then you got to get out of the drive. Out of the drive. You have to go drive through. You know, I live in South Lake. So you got to drive through South Lake to get on the 114 freeway or get on the 121 freeway. Then you got to take all that, go down to Arlington. Then you got to go find a parking spot. You got to go deal with that. Then you got to go find your seat. And finally, you sit in your seat and get to watch the baseball game. So, again, all these different things you have to go do before you finally get to enjoy being a spectator at a baseball game. Right. And so, you know, everything is about the same. I mean, in physics, you got to do a number of different things in order to be able to come up with an answer. So this is this is no different. So I have a uh, problem here. It's a lot of words. So be ready. A 325 kilogram boat. Oh, I'm going through pens like it's going on style. Go to Walmart here pretty soon. All right. 325 kilogram boat another boat is sailing 15.0 degrees north of east I'm going to write this a little smaller because this, this is a lot of words north of east Uh, at a speed of 2.00 meters per second. All right. Um, 30 seconds later. It is sailing at 35.0 degrees north of east. I guess I'm using capital of east. At a speed of 4.00 meters per second. Okay, um, during the time, during this time, three forces act on the boat. Okay, it's a 31.0 Newton force.
directed at 15 degrees north of east. Um, that's uh, due to a, an auxiliary engine. All right. Um, 23.0 newton, newton force directed 15, 15 degrees south of east. Three point zero Newton force, sorry. There. South of East. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, south of west, sorry about that. south of west, uh, and that's a uh, resisted resistance due to water. F sub W do the wind. We don't know F sub W. Okay. Um, find the magnetic direction of the force F sub W. All right, so there's a lot of work that has to be done in this problem. Okay, and again, this is, you know, again, we started off easy. We're going progressively more difficult. So, again, we have a boat. We know the mass of the boat, 325 kilograms, is sailing 15 degrees north of east. So, basically, in this direction, first quadrant, at a speed of 2.00 meters per second. Um, 30 seconds later, so, again, it has initial velocity, V naught. 30 seconds later, it is sailing at 35 degrees north of east at a speed of 4.00 meters a second. So we have a final velocity V. These are vectors. You know, so again, in 30 seconds, T equals 30 seconds. It goes from an initial V naught to a final velocity V. Something caused that. What caused that? Well, you no, know, that, that was that, that was an acceleration uh, that you noticed. Now that of course is caused by net force, Newton's second law. Okay. During this time, three forces. Act on the boat. A 31.0 a 31 Newton force uh, directed 15 degrees uh, north of east due to an auxiliary engine. A 23.0 Newton force um, directed 15 degrees south of west. And that's resistance due to water. And an F sub W due to wind. We don't know F sub W. That's, that's the wind force. Find the magnetic direction of the wind force. All right, so this is going to be a lot of work. But it kind of shows you, it kind of ties together a lot of things. So once you capture that, let's let's now translate the uh, the English into mathematics. All right. So I'm going to erase all this stuff now. <coughs> so here we go. That's the beauty about your pause button is if you didn't catch everything, you can always pause it. All right. So here we go. So there's going to be a lot of stuff. So so first of all, we know the mass, we know the forces, and we don't quite know the acceleration. So, you know, we have to kind of find the acceleration. And the things, we, we actually don't know all the forces. We don't know the wind force. One of the forces in the summation of all the forces in Newton's law, Newton's second law, we do not know. So that's what makes this problem difficult. So what we have to kind of do is kind of like, you know, always kind of draw a little, a little, um, I would say, a, a strategy, of what you want to do. So, you know, the mass grates. You know the sum of all forces and mass times acceleration. So for you to be able to do anything, you got to find the acceleration. So we have to do that, all right? And so 
So what we have to do is we have to understand, you know, first of all, what is this problem? So let's kind of draw this problem off to the side. So we have for uh, some forces acting on this problem. Now I don't know what the wind what the wind force is. We have no idea. So I really can't, there's no point in me drawing it on here because I have no idea what it looks like yet. But let me at least draw the forces that I do know. Well, I do know that there is a force due to the engine. Oops. All right, let me try to do this a little bit better. All right, so I have the force due to the engine. I'll call that F sub E, E for engine. Okay, E in this case means engine. The force due to the auxiliary engine, F sub E. It is at what? It is at 15 degrees. Above the, you know, basically north of east. Again, north, south, east, west. Corresponds to plus x and minus x here for east and west, plus y and minus y for north and south. I also know <clears throat> that there's another force. And I'll call this uh, F sub R for resistance. Resistive force from the water. Okay, F ooh, sub R. And I'm told that that's 15 degrees south of west. 15 degrees, so we have R. R stands for resistive force. I'd use W for water, but nah, I want to use W for wind. All right. So we have these, and the thing I don't know anything about is F sub W. I'm not even going to try to draw it on my map. I don't know where it is. I mean, that's the whole, I and mean, if I knew where it was, that's the answer to this whole problem. Wind force. So again, that's the force that I'm looking for. I don't know what that is. That's the whole point of this problem is to find F sub W. I mean, again, those are my forces. I can't draw FCW in the map yet because I don't know what it is. All right, so let's uh, do the problem. So first and foremost, I got to find with the acceleration. So, <clears throat> all right, so well, first of all, let's take a look at what are, well, let's let's first of all talk about the acceleration. So I know I have a V naught, initial velocity. What am I being told? I mean, told if I go back to reading what I said here is I it's it's a it's a fifty. So basically, I have a um, speed of two point zero zero meters per second, and that's fifteen degrees. Um, let's see here, boat. Yeah, so so like the velocity, the forces are in the same direction as block. Okay. So the initial velocity is fifteen degrees north of east. All right. So that means my V naught is going to be my magnitude V naught cosine of 15 degrees. Again, it's 15 degrees north of east. X hat plus V naught sine 15 degrees Y hat. Okay, so again, my initial, and, and what is V naught? It's 2.00 meters per second. So V naught, my initial velocity, is 2.00 meters per second, reading the problem, times the cosine of 15 degrees. Again, the, the initial velocity, again, this it happens to be that the initial velocity happens to be lined up with the end with the at the engine force. So I'm just kind of I'm pointing at the engine force, but really I can be I'm really pointing out the initial velocity as well. Initial velocity is initially in alignment with the engine force. So 15 degrees means it's it's a first quadrant vector. And again, the adjacent is your X component. And then you have 2.00 meters per second, sine 15 degrees. That's your Y component. Again, they're both positive because it's a it's a quadrant, it's a first quadrant vector. If I work this out, I find out that V naught. Initial velocity vector, again, in vector form, two-dimensional vector, is 1.93 x hat plus um, 
0.518 y hat. So mostly x component because it's a shallow angle. Again, that's meters per second. Okay, 1.93 x hat plus 0.518 y hat. That is my initial velocity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to store it at the top here. So I'm going to erase this stuff and basically write this up here. And then normally I wouldn't have to do that on my paper, but again, I'm I have, I'm doing real estate conservation here. So all right, so here we go. So kind of storing it in my little parking lot here is that V naught is 1.93 x hat plus 0.518 y hat meters per second. All right, that's my initial velocity vector. 30 seconds later, I have another velocity, and I'm being told that now it's 4 meters, 4.0 meters per second, but now it's being directed at 35 degrees. All right, so 30 seconds later, so we'll say t equals 30 seconds later. We have a final velocity. What's it going to be? Well, it's going to be the final velocity magnitude. Again, it's 35 degrees north of B, so still a first quadrant vector. It's still going to have a positive X and a positive Y component. So V cosine 35 degrees X hat plus V, again, this is magnitude V. I took the hat off. Sine 35 degrees. Yeah. plus V sine 35 degrees Y hat. So what's that going to be? Well, V is going to be, and I'm being told now the magnitude is 4.00 meters per second. That's the speed. 4.00 meters per second, cosine 35 degrees X hat, plus 4.00 meters per second, sine 35 degrees y hat, I find out that the final velocity there after the 30 second uh, period is going to be 3.28 x hat uh, plus 2.29 y hat. And again, the units in that are meters per second. All right, I'm going to put that in my parking lot. All right, so I'm going to erase all this and put this up here. So again, this is just for the purposes of real estate. All right, so again, did all the work, I'm just gonna store it. So what did I say? 3.28 X hat plus 2.29 Y hat. And that's, again, the units are meters per second. Put a little comma there in the units there for you. All right, so those are my velocities. Now, now comes for me to find the accelerations. All right, so I got to do a component by component. So let's start off with the x direction. X direction, what do we got? What do we have? Well, I know that um, V sub x is V naught sub x uh, plus A sub x times time. Again, I'm just using. I'm just using a kinematic equation, and I'm basically turning this into a one-dimensional problem. I'm going to do an x-dimension problem. And so what do I do? Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to solve for a sub x. So how's that going to be? Well, a sub x is simply going to be v sub x minus v naught sub x divided by the time. I'm just doing a couple steps of algebra 1. I'm subtracting out v naught sub x divided by the time. I'm flipping the equation over, so I'm solving for a sub x. I like that. I like to write what I'm looking for on the left-hand side of the equation. If I write this, I find out that a sub x, plugging in my values, I find out that it's going to be 3.28 meters per second. That's the final velocity. Again, x direction, final, final x, 3.28. Minus the initial x uh, velocity component, 1.93. And that's divided by the time, which I was told that this all is occurring over 30 seconds. I find out that a sub x, <clears throat> when I do that, is going to be 4.5 times 10 negative 2 meters per second squared. Pretty small. You know, it's a big boat. 4.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters per second squared. That is my x component of velocity. All right, great. 
I will put that in my parking lot now. Again, as, as I go along, I'm just going to try to store. So I got the X component of velocity. All right. So I'll put that on my parking lot. Just storing information that's important. 4.5. So this is pretty small. This is 4.5 centimeters per second squared. So again, it's a big shift. <coughs> All right, so there you go. Uh, y component now. So again, same math. What do I know? Well, I got V sub Y is V naught sub Y. Again, we're doing a Y component now. And V sub Y equals V naught sub Y plus A sub Y T. Again, from chapter two, solve, same math. A sub Y is V sub Y minus V naught sub Y all divided by T. A sub y is, what's V sub y? It's the final velocity in a y direction, 2.29 meters per second minus initial velocity, 0.518. And all of that, again, all of this is again occurring over a 30 second time interval. I find out now that A sub y is going to equal 5.91. Times 10 to the negative 2 meters per second. Again, 5.91 centimeters per second. Squared, sorry. All right, there's, a, there's an acceleration for you. <clears throat> so I'll put that in the parking lot. All right, so again, I'm just collecting stuff. I mean, again, this is a very involved problem, more or less. A sub y. I mean, it's a typical problem for kinematics. 5.91 times 10 to the negative 2 meters per second squared. There you go. So... So that's a bunch of very important information that I now have. Now I have acceleration information. So now what I can actually do is I can now apply Newton's laws. We're getting actually, we're closer to the end than you may think. So now that I know this information, I will now apply Newton's second law. So sum of all forces, again, is mass times acceleration. Again, this is the generalized Newton's second law. It is agnostic to any coordinate system. So again, I will I will write, I will choose the XY or Cartesian system, and then I'll write you know the corresponding coordinates. So sum of all forces in the X direction is mass times the acceleration in the X direction, sum of all forces in the Y direction is mass times acceleration in the Y direction. Okay, so I'm gonna need both of those. And of course, if I needed to do a Z equation, I could. So let's let's focus one equation at a time. So I'm gonna do the X equation. I'm gonna erase this for conserve, conserving real estate. And so we're going to, so again, Newton's second law is true in every single um, uh, scalar equation. <clears throat> so sum of all forces in the x direction. So let's work that out first. Let's see. What, what do we know? Well, the x direction, we know that the, there's the engine force, and it's going to have a positive x and a positive y. So it's going to give you a positive x direction, the engine forces. So it's going to be f sub e. Magnitude, cosine of 15 degrees, x hat. Again, it's positive. Magnitudes are sineless. So when I write a magnitude, you know, there's no sign associated with that. The component is either positive or negative. Well, in this case, it's positive. All right, x hat. What else corresponds? What else applies? Well, I also have the, res the water resistance force, F sub r. It's a third quadrant force, so third quadrant means what? Negative x and negative y. So it's going to be negative. So it'll be negative f sub r cosine 15 degrees x hat. And in fact, we're, we don't even have to write the x hat any longer because we, we know we're talking about x coordinate, right? So that's kind of a mistake on my part. Or I guess we're... Not really a mistake, but an overstatement. F sub r cosine 15 degrees. There you go. Because we're talking about x direction, so x hat's understood. <clears throat> and finally, <clears throat> we have plus f sub w x. I have no idea where, where the x coordinate is. I just know it has an x component. I'm going to assume positive x. If I'm wrong, then... If my assumption is wrong, then I'll then this number will be negative, and that's okay. I, I'll still get the right answer. It just means I made the assumption that it, 
was a positive X. And oh, by the way, it was a negative X. So that's okay. You know, again, I'm just making an assumption of positive X and I'll make an also assumption of positive Y. And if I'm wrong, it just means I'll have a negative sign in my answer. And I'm still right. I just, I just, I just, I know what the direction is. It's the, it's the other way. <clears throat> all right. So those are the sum of all my forces. And that's going to be mass times acceleration in the X direction. I actually know all of this. I just got done figuring out A sub X and I know the mass I'm given to max. So what I can actually do is solve for F sub W X right now. That's what I want. All right, we'll solve for that. This will be an equation that I'll keep for later. All right, so how do I solve this? Well, F sub W X is going to be what? I'll have M A sub X. Okay. And I'll, sub, I'll add F sub, F sub R on the other side, and I'll subtract uh, the F sub E on the other side. So it becomes, um, <clears throat> uh, and I'll just do this now. So it's going to be minus F sub E cosine of 15 degrees, and then plus F sub R cosine of 15 degrees. All I'm doing is algebra. I'm solving for F sub W X. I already have M, sub, M A sub X on the other side. I got to throw the other two terms on the other side. So this becomes negative. This becomes positive. So there you go. That is, I'm pretty close to being ready to solve for F sub W X. I, have, I actually know all this now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my parking lot now. I got this. That was from the X coordinate equation. So I'm going to, I'm just, something else that I know, <clears throat> write it up here. I know an equation for F sub W X now, the wind force, which is what I'm after. It's going to be M A sub X minus F sub E cosine of 15 degrees plus F sub R cosine of 15 degrees. All right. So again, that's another piece of information that I need to know. And I really have one more piece of information that I need to know. And I'll get that by applying Newton's second law in the y direction. So, in doing so, I will say the sum of all forces in the y direction. Okay, what are those forces going to be? Well, look at the engine force. It's plus x and plus y. It's a positive. So, again, positive F sub e. This time it's the opposite or the sine of 15 degrees. Okay, again, this third quadrant force is a negative X and a negative Y. So again, I'll have a negative F sub R. And again, it's a sine 15 degrees because it is the opposite. And again, I don't know what F sub W is. I'm just going to call it F sub W Y. And I don't know what it is, right? I'm just going to assume it's positive X, positive Y. And, I'll, and whatever the signs happen to be, it'll, it'll pretty much correct itself at the very end. Okay, that's going to equal M A sub Y. So I'm all forces mass times acceleration in the Y direction. And if I solve this, I'll find out that F sub W Y, see if I have enough room to write the final equation, F sub W Y, okay, so what's it going to be? I'm solving for F sub W Y. So I'll have M A sub Y already on the other side. And again, same math. I gotta subtract F sub, the, the engine component and add the resist the water resistant components. This becomes negative, this becomes positive. So again, this becomes um, minus F sub E sine 15 degrees and plus F sub R sine of 15 degrees. And that'll give me the wind component in the y direction. So I will put that together. So again, I'm, my, my parking lot's becoming more and more uh, busy. So here we go. F sub W Y in my parking lot is going to equal M A sub Y minus F sub E sine 15 degrees plus F sub R 
sine, I'll just erase this stuff here. We know what th this means now, 15 degrees. All right, those are the equations that I now can use to finally solve this problem. All right, so now it's, I have done all the algebra. I mean, again, say to my, say to my givens, did some background scratch work to get the accelerations, the kinematics in each dimension, figure out the, the forces, now I'm ready to go. So F to W X, what's it gonna be? Well, again, I'm given the mass of the, uh, of the ship here. 325 kilograms. All right, I'm given the acceleration. That's going to be 4.5. Or not, not given, I calculated it. 4.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters per second squared. Okay, that's that first term, ma sub x. Minus f sub e. Now again, F sub E, we calculated, uh, we're actually we're given F sub E. We we're told it was 31 newtons, if you remember back in your notes. We're, we're told the engine thrust is, the auxiliary engine thrust is 31.0 newtons. That's a given. All right. And again, that's going to be cosine 15 degrees. Again, following this, so again, M A sub X, F sub E, minus F sub E, cosine 15 degrees. I have one more term plus F sub R. And you go back in your notes, you remember the F sub R is 23 newtons times the cosine of 15 degrees. All right. So again, S sub W X is M A sub X. 325 kilograms times 4.5 times negative 2 meters second square from what I calculated earlier. Minus from the algebra, 31.0 newtons. That's F sub E. Cosine 15 degrees plus F sub R, 23.0 newtons. So it's cosine 15 degrees. If I work all this stuff out, I find, work all this math out, I will find out that F sub WX is 6.90 newtons. All that, all that stuff for a simple number. All right. So let's write. So what I'm going to do now is I've already used the F sub WX equation. I got the answer that I want now. So what I can actually do now is I'm going to erase this equation and, and stick the number in its place now. So again, for conservation of real estate. So I'm going to take this equation and stick a nice simple little number there. That's what I want. And it turns out that it is a first quadrant vector. 6.90 newtons. All right. F to W, Y. Let's work that out now. So I'm going to erase all this. And now I'm now going to make a direct application of the F to W, Y equation. I find out the F to W, Y. M A sub Y, again, 325 kilograms. Times, what's the acceleration? Again, I read it up here, 5.91 times 10 to the negative two meters per second squared. All right, what's next? Minus the engine, 31.0 Newtons, engine thrust times the sine of 15 degrees and um let's see here plus the water resistance and reading it still uh here it is 23 newtons sine of 15 degrees if i work all this stuff out i find out that i'll just write it up here the f sub w y is going to be 17.1 newtons. So this is a first quadrant vector. Great. Positive x and positive y. All that work, and that's what I want. But I'm not done yet. And I always want to return the vector as I was given it. So really, all I have, I can erase everything except these two pieces of information. Now. All right. And so let's just do that. I've got everything that I need. Now, um, in fact, I can just erase even this. So I... At the end, all I really have are these two very important numbers that I calculated, all right? And so all the stuff I did here, this is just previous work to get this answer. So this is my answer. F sub W X is 6.90 Newtons. And F sub W Y is 17.1 Newtons. Now, what to do? Um, well, I got a... It's a first quadrant vector. Why? Because it's a positive x and a positive y. So 
this final answer, this wind is blowing northeast. So again, north, south, east, west, plus x, minus x, plus y, minus y. And so I have a vector that looks like this, f sub w. It has components, f sub w y and f sub w x. It's at an angle theta. I got to figure this stuff out. Now. So again, what's left is Pythagorean theorem. So f sub w is the square root of f sub w x squared plus f sub w y squared. All right. So f sub w, the wind force, the magnitude. I don't have a hat on it. Again, I'm just getting the magnitude. Plug it in, and it's 6.90 newtons squared plus 17.1 newtons squared square root of all of that. I find out that F sub W, applying Pythagorean theorem, will be 18.4 newtons. Great. So that's an answer. Put it in my parking lot. F sub W is 18.4 newtons. That's the magnitude of that vector, the wind force. How about the, uh, the direction? Again, deja vu, I will apply the inverse tangent. Theta is the inverse tangent of the opposite over the adjacent. And again, this, ha this is still y over x, even though it not always is. So it's f sub w y over f sub w x. Theta is the inverse tangent of 17.1 newtons divided by 6.90 newtons. Theta is, work it all out, you get 68 degrees. All right, so theta is 68 degrees. What is my final answer? Final answer for the wind force, after all that work, the wind force is 18.4 newtons at 68 degrees north of east. That's my answer to this problem. And this is a typical full-blown kinematics problem. Okay, so it doesn't get any prettier than that. And we, again, we've so far have involved all four chapters in this an, in this in this uh, answer. So again, it's kind of a review of everything, but this is really putting it all together. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about next. So we talked about forces, and I still have one more law of physics to uh, introduce to you. And so I'm just going to, I guess I'll kind of do it now. Um, So essentially, um, well, let me just, I'll, I'll, let me hold off. I'll, I'll talk about gravity next. So one of the things we want to do is talk about uh, various kinds of forces. And it's, well, you know what? Let me give you Newton's third law. And then we'll, I'll just work some more problems here. So Newton's third law in its, uh, Official form, let's just write it down. So again, there's one more law of physics. I talk about Newton's second law. Newton's third law of motion. Okay, so the official legalese type of way of writing it would be whenever... Uh, one body exerts a force on the second body. Um, the first body experiences a force that is equal in magnitude.
and opposite in direction. to the force that it exerts. Now, one, you know, you might say more in the slang, you know, you hear that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, so the fact that you're sitting in your chair and the chair is pushing against the earth and you weigh, you know, you have a certain mass, you have a certain body mass, that mass times gravity is your weight. Well, the earth is pushing back on you exactly as much as you're pushing on it with your weight. And that force is called the normal force. All right, and so let me, um, let me erase this here. Normal force is an example of the existence of Newton's third law. So let me uh, erase this for a moment. Let me talk about the normal force, and we'll do some problems that involve the normal force as well. So the normal force, um, so again, you know that as you sit in your chair watching this video, Your weight, you have a mass, M, and you exert a force on the earth, of magnitude Mg. The earth pushes back with an equal and opposite force called the normal force. Typically, we'll oftentimes refer, we use the letter N for the normal force. Now, the question is, what does normal mean? It is not the normal that you have in your vernacular. Normal usually means typical or usual. It, is the, it does not mean that here. So let me erase this now. All right, we'll talk about the normal force. So the normal force, so essentially, if a force, so... You imagine, for instance, that the normal force, so let's, let's kind of back up. Normal in mathematics <coughs> um, normal mathematics means perpendicular to a surface, all right? So for instance, um, you give an example here, is I have, I have, I have basically a clipboard. Now on my clipboard, I can put on my cell phone on the clipboard. So on my clipboard, you see my cell phone. It is sitting on this flat surface. The clipboard is a flat surface. Now, normal to that surface, perpendicular to the surface, is always, if, if I were to call the clipboard an XY plane, the normal, no matter where I sample on the clipboard, the normal is going to be in the Z direction. It is always going to be in the Z direction for a planar surface, like the XY plane. So if I take my, my cell phone, 
the weights if i if i have my if i have my uh clipboard you know exactly lined up parallel to the ground the weight is going to be along the negative z axis but then the normal force is going to be perpendicular to the surface it'll be along the positive z axis and so it's always going to be the 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 force that the that the surface exerts on the body is always going to be in normal direction so in the sense where if i have something simple like my cell phone i have mass and i have a nice flat surface then the normal is going to be perpendicular to that surface so that may be my normal force and this would be the weight mg now someone might ask well is normal force always in uh uh is, is it always perpendicular to a flat surface well let's take an, another more complicated example so again for a flat surface the perpendicular to the surface is always if i call the flat surface if i if i if i characterize it as having an x co x coordinate and a y coordinate well the normal is going to be in the z direction for a flat surface what if i have something more complicated let's just take a for instance i have an example of this globe so i have a i have a globe here i'll bring it out here in a second so I have this globe, all right? So you see this globe here, and you see that it is round. It is a sphere. And I want to look at, you know, let's say I want a particular surface right here. Well, the normal of that is going to be going this direction. The normal over in this particular part of the surface will be going that way. The normal, so the normal is always along a radial. Now, we live on a sphere like this. We tend to think that we now if we look around, we go outside, go outside our house here and look around Texas. Texas looks pretty flat. Well, we know we live on a round. We live on a round object. We live on a spherical Earth. Why do we think it's flat? Because we live on such a very, very small portion of the sphere that it looks flat to us. It's it's like you know if you're when we're talking about doing a um, you know calculation of speed or, or velocity. You know, we said, well, you know, initially, if I were to talk about, you know, one point and another point, well, there's a curve here. But if I get small and small enough, it looks linear. You know, small enough, you know, I can make a linear approximation. Well, in two dimensions, yeah, we live on a spherical surface, but small enough, in a small enough patch, like a little patch, like, like Fort Worth, Texas, you know, that looks like a flat piece. Normal, then, even though, yes, it is officially along the radial direction, for us, it appears as it's going straight up to the sky. All right. And so, again, normal is always perpendicular to a surface. This is a more complicated surface of the sphere. Again, normal is perpendicular to the surface. All right. And so, and I'll give you more examples of a normal force as we go along. Now, I've given you all of newton's three laws and again i will work out some problems talking about newton's laws what i want to talk about now is the fundamental force law called the universal law of gravity of, of i'm sorry newton's law of universal gravitation all right and so let's talk about that next so this also came out of the principia newton's law of universal gravitation so essentially what this says is listen i always like to try to draw spheres you know for simplicity but let's say you have two objects of an object one and an object two and i'm drawing them i mean again i'm trying to even though it looks like it's two dimensions, I'm really trying to draw spheres. Each of these objects has a radius. You know, I'm not going to really worry about the radius, but the reality is we'll say this has a mass M1. This has a mass M2. And let's draw a center to center line. We'll call this line uh, capital R. Again, this is going from the center of one object to the center of the other. So all we know is that these two objects have masses. I'm, I'm drawing them as spheres just for simplicity, but it could be any shape. Going from the center of one to the center of the other. 
And the center to center distance is R. So again, R is the center to center distance. There is a law of the universe that says that there is a universal law of attraction. There's a force of attraction between these two objects because they have mass. It's a vector. It is saying that the gravitational force, I'll put a little G for gravity. Gravitational, I'll put a little, little G on here. The gravitational force between these objects is given as capital G, which is a universal constant. I'll talk about that in a moment. Times the mass of one body times the mass of the second body divided by their center to center distance squared. And it's in, I call it the R hat direction. All this really says is it's pointed along the line from center to center. It's a mutual attraction. That means that M1 feels that force because of M2 and M2 feels that force because of M1. They feel the same force. It is a mutual attractive force. And this force only exists for whatever reason in the universe. It exists because objects have mass. And so Newton once said that the force that, that causes an apple to fall from a tree is the same force that causes the moon to go around the earth. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that here now. So what have we been saying all along? Well, let's, I'm going to erase this for a moment here. And let's imagine here, I'm going to redraw this picture. Let me actually, let me tell you what G is first. G is a universal gravitation constant. It's a constant of the universe for whatever reason, you know, this constant exists. It's given as 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. This is the Newtons gravitational constant. Universal gravitational constant. As far as we understand, it is true throughout the universe, at least from the universe that we can actually observe. You know, we can, you know, we can pretty much understand there's about 100 billion galaxies, and each galaxy contains about 100 billion stars, and many of those stars have planets around them. All right, and so again, universal gravitation constant is truly universal. It means it's throughout the universe. Now, in theoretical physics and in most advanced, you know, forms like in string theory, uh, there is a belief in what's called a multiverse. That means that we're just one of many universes. This particular universe is actually described by various constants. So in this universe, we have a constant, you know, uh, you know, uh, we have, G is one of our constants, and there's various other constants. We haven't really talked about various constants yet, but this is a constant of the universe. This makes Newton's law of gravitation um, um, what it is. Right, now, let's kind of blow up my picture now. I, I, let's imagine now that I have a big Earth. So I have the surface of this big Earth. I'm on this big Earth, okay? I mean, it's so big I can't even draw it here. This is the mass of the Earth, all right? Now let's... Do a better job, I guess. Big Earth. All right. And we know that this is our Earth. It's going to have a big mass. Uh, mass of the Earth is actually uh, called mass of the Earth. Mass of the Earth actually is given as 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. It is a huge mass. All right. So that's just the mass of the Earth. All right. Now, I want to find out, um, you know, essentially um, what um, what is um, well. Let's see. We have mass of the Earth. We have, let's say, U or whatever mass. I mean, any other mass compared to the mass of the Earth is, is minuscule, and of course, the Earth has a radius. So if you're you're a distance. So many Earth is a sphere. Your distance R sub E, the radius of the Earth from the center of the Earth, right? 
So radius of the Earth, we know as 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. Again, you can look this, you can look these up. So here you are, a little m. You're a little m, the mass of the earth is big M, and you want to find out, well, what is what, what is your weight? Well, I mean, what what first of all, what is the what is the uh, force between you and the earth? So you go and you do Newton's law of gravitation. Again, you're gonna be looking at the radial direction. So you're going to be going along, you might call it the y-axis, but we can call it the radial axis. It doesn't really matter. It's along the radial direction, r hat. So I'm going to basically sum all forces between you and the Earth, and I'll do it in a radial direction. So I'll say, well, what's, what's the force? Well, the force is going to be, the only force is going to be G, mass of the Earth, mass of U, divided by r squared. And what do we know that as? We know that's mass times acceleration. Well, we fall to the Earth at what acceleration? We fall to the Earth at the acceleration of gravity, right? Mg. So sum of all forces, you know, it's only one force acting. G, mass of the Earth, mass of U, divided by r squared equals mg. Now notice that there's your mass, or the mass of whatever object you're looking at, whatever test mass, is the same on both sides. We can actually cancel those. We now have an expression for the acceleration of gravity. So I'm going to erase this. We now have an expression for the acceleration of gravity. So let's look at this. G, acceleration of gravity, is G, mass of the Earth, divided by R squared. Or, I apologize, I used capital R, didn't I? R squared. Let's plug in our numbers and find out what we get. So G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared, the universal gravitation constant. Mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Divided by the center to center distance squared, or basically the radius of the Earth squared, or 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters, and don't forget to square that. If you do all of this calculation, you should find that you should get about 9.80 meters per second squared. It is no accident that the gravitational acceleration of the Earth is 9.80 meters per second squared. In fact, we can prove it with Newton's law of gravitation. So what did we just show? We just, we just basically verified Newton's statement that the force that causes the moon to go around the earth is the same force that causes an apple to fall from a tree. We know why things accelerate at G, and that is because of the application of Newton's law of gravitation. We can calculate for it for earth or for any other planet or moon. In fact, let's, let's do it for Mars. So let's uh, maybe do Cottonwood Johnson 4.21. All right. So 4.21 Cottonwood Johnson. Let me erase this. Cottonwood Johnson. 4.21. All right. What does it say? Mars has a mass of 6.46 and 1023 kilograms. Okay. Um, and a radius. of uh, 3.39 times 10 to 6 meters. So it's a little bit smaller than the Earth. All right. What is the acceleration due to gravity on Mars?
Okay, B. That's A. B. Um, how much would a sixty-five kilogram person weigh on, on this planet? All right, so we're told the mass of Mars and the radius of Mars. So as I, if you go and use the formula that I just got done doing, it's a simple application to find the acceleration of gravity, then we'll use that to find the weight of this person. All right, so there's your information. I'm gonna erase this so I can do the problem. Cutnell Johnson, 4.21. All right, so. What do we know? So we know the mass of Mars, capital M, is 6.46. So I'm going to translate this now to English, times 10 to the 23 kilograms. We know the radius of Mars is 3.39 times 10 to the sixth meters. And so what do we want to do? Well, what's our formula? G, little g. Acceleration gravitational constant of Mars is capital G, capital M divided by R squared. All right. We have 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. The mass of Mars is 6.46 times 10 to the 20, 6.46 times 10 to the 23 kilograms divided by the radius of Mars squared, 3.39 times 10 to the sixth meters, 20 squared. We find out that the gravitational acceleration on Mars <coughs> is 3.75 meters per second squared. Well, the gravitational acceleration on Earth is 9.8. So what is that? 3.75 divided by 9.8, 38%. So the gravitational acceleration on the on Mars is only 38% that of Earth. So the problem is, you know, you have people that want to go to Mars, and yet the problem the problem is, you know, what you don't realize is that in your life, as we you know, as we've evolved to be Earth creatures, everything we do. Our size, our muscles, the, the operations of our body are all bathed in a gravitational force field of the earth. Okay, we are constantly fighting against the, the force of gravity every single moment of our lives. And one of the things that people find out is when we go to a place like the International Space Station, you can, do, you can work out all you want. You can lift weights all day long. You're not going to be able to have the same muscle tone as you just have walking around the earth, constantly fighting against gravity. You'll find out if you're in a place where your gravitational force is weaker, you'll find out that your muscles will atrophy. And then other things like, you know, how your heart works and your, and your lungs, and your digestive system, everything depends upon being in the gravitational force field. So the people who may go to Mars, you know, there's questions about, well, okay, if you live there long enough, can you actually go back to Earth? You know, can you have, can you deliver a child on Mars? I mean, one of the things you have to do on Mars, I would think, would be to try to, to try to have some sort of artificial gravity. Because you have to have humans in a situation similar. Maybe they might work out in the Martian atmosphere during the day or Mar in the Mars during the day. But they, they have to have a significant amount of time where they're experiencing their home gravity. All right, so anyway, that's part A. Part B says, well, how much would a 65 kilogram person weigh? Well, how do you figure out weight? Weight is mass times gravity. So now weight is 65 kilograms. Normally, if we're on Earth, we'd multiply by 9.8, but we're on Mars. So we multiply by 3.75 meters per second squared. We find out that a person weighs the weight of this person on Mars is going to be 244 newtons. You know, so 
kind of a joke I always tell people, you know, you know, people who are, you know, say they want to go lose weight. Well, you lose weight, you can just go to another planet, to lose weight, right? You really want, you really want to lose mass. That's what you want to lose. Not, you know, weight is just a uh, mass times gravity. So you can go to another planet to lose weight. All right. So anyway, that's two point, uh, that's cotton on Johnson. I'm sorry, 4.21. All right, so let's see here. Um, let me do a uh, another problem. Um, I'm gonna do Cutnell Johnson four point twenty two. All right, Cutno Johnson 4.22 says on Earth, all right, um, two parts of a space probe are separated by a center-to-center -center distance. Of 12 meters. Okay. Um, and may be treated as uniform spherical objects. And maybe treated as uniform spherical objects. All right. Um, find the magnitude of the gravitational force that each part exerts on the other. All right. Um, oh, out in space, far from other objects. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so on Earth, two parts of a space probe are separated by a center-to-center -center distance of 12 meters and may be treated as uniform spherical objects. Find the magnitude of the gravitational force that each part exper experiences, oh, sorry, sorry, exerts on the other out in space far from the other objects, okay? So we know that, um, that essentially you have, uh, oops, you know what? I didn't, I didn't write this down. Uh, let me write, <laughs> sorry, let me rewrite this problem. I didn't write it properly. Forgot to put the, the weights. All right, I missed something. On Earth, two parts. So scratch that last one. On Earth, two parts of a space probe. Way. All right, yeah, definitely scratch that last problem. Way, uh, 11,000 Newtons and 3,400 Newtons. Okay, 
<clears throat> Sorry about that. These parts are separated by a center to center distance of 12 meters. Okay. And may be treated as uniform spherical objects. Find the magnitude of the gravitational force. that each part exerts on the other out in space. Far from any other objects. All right, here we go. Sorry about the previous faux pas there. All right. So, on Earth, two parts of a space probe weigh 11,000 newtons and 3,400 newtons. That's what, it, that's what they weigh on Earth. That's important. Uh, we'll use that information to get their masses. These parts are separated by a center to center distance of 12 meters. We're going out in space now, 12 meters. Maybe treated as uniform spherical objects. It means we can do center to center distance really easily. Find the magnitude of the gravitational force that each part exerts on the other out in space, far from any other objects. All right, so, um, so let's do this. There you go, you got it. Now, let's. First of all, we got to figure out what their masses are. So all in all, we got to apply Newton's law of universal gravitation. We're going to find out what their mutual forces on each other, right? And so we know that these objects, we'll say, we'll have an object M1, some spherical, and an object M2. Ah, I don't keep doing that. <laughs> M2, and there's a center to center distance R. Okay, so we are so we have to figure out we, we don't know what M1 and M2 are right now, but we do know the weight. We know that we'll say W1 is 11,000 newtons, and that W2, the second weight, is 3,400 newtons. And we can essentially say, well, what's the weight? Well, the weight, weight one is M1g. So M1 is going to simply be weight 1 divided by G. And we're on the Earth. We're weighing them on the Earth, right? So 11,000 newtons divided by 9.80 meters per second squared. So understanding by weighing it on Earth, I know what the mass is. It's going to be 1.12 and I'm third kilograms. So great, so I know that information now. So I'll just write it up here. I'm gonna write it up here. So M1 for my calculation is 1.12 times 10 to the third kilograms. And I can do the exact same problem now by doing, by basically substituting for twos. Weight two is M2. Uh, and then essentially what I, what I now know is is I can do the same thing for the other part. And that's 3,400 kilograms divided by nine, I'm sorry, 3,400 newtons, <clears throat> divided by 9.80 meters per second squared. I find out that the second mass, M2, when I do that is going to be 
347 kilograms. All right, so I did the work to get these to get these uh, masses. Now it's a matter of just applying Newton's law of gravitation. So now I know the mass. I'm going to go to I'm going to go to outer space now. In outer space, I'll say, okay, well the force, the grav mutual gravitational force these masses exert on one another, force of attraction is capital G M1 M2 divided by R squared. Gravitational force is going to be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilograms squared. Mass 1, 1.12 times 10 to the third kilograms. Mass 2, 347 kilograms. Divided by the center to center distance of 12, just 12 meters, we're told. Don't forget to square it. Okay, there's Newton's sec, uh, law of gravitation. It says that, it says that each object will, for, will, will feel an attractive force of, one, of just 1.80 times 10 to the negative 7 Newtons. So the gravitational force is extremely feeble. Very, very weak. It's the weakest of all the fundamental forces of the universe. It is the weakest force by 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 a by a ton. It's about something like ten to the twenty eighth times weaker than the, the electromagnetic force, and then and that force is weaker than the strong and weak nuclear forces. Why we even know about gravity? Why it's so even so important? Is because the planetary masses and the solar masses, or you know, the masses of the stars and the planets, are so ridiculously large. As I said, you know, you have the mass of the Earth is. 5.98 to 10 and 24th kilograms. Mass of the sun, you'll find out is actually 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilogram. So again, you're talking about an incredibly large masses. That is why you get the appreciable forces that you do. All right. So I'm going to continue on to the next video. Um, this one's about to run out at three hours. So race this and. Um, We'll just end this video here and we'll start a new one.